Uh, we can go now to Owen Jones from The Guardian, who joins us from North London, and Dia Chakravarti, the uh, Brexit editor of The Telegraph, who is in South London. Uh, Owen Jones, uh, first of all, um, tell me about the pain uh, that Labour is in now. You know, we're having yet another policy review. I reeled off probably about eight or nine since... Uh, uh, 2010, and this is the idea that uh, basically Keir Starmer said we're going to have a, a policy review, but it's going to actually be conducted in a matter of weeks. What will that actually deliver? Well, I think that's an open question because never in recent times has Labour gone into elections so lacking in a basic vision. I mean, if you, you know, I was in up in Hartlepool. Uh, but this has been corroborated by reports across the country. People simply don't know what Labour stands for anymore. Uh, it, you know, Keir Starmer's whole approach and his whole team was to define themselves against the predecessor, Jeremy Corbyn and Boris Johnson, yeah. but without defining what he actually stands for. And there's been a complete vacuum left by the Labour Party when it comes to policy or vision. What would Labour actually do with political power? That's not a question I'm afraid that voters can answer, but I don't think it's one they can answer either. And, and I think what the policy review has to do is, I mean, bear in mind, the Tories do have a vision at the moment. They have a very clear, coherent vision. They fused populist nationalism with investment. These aren't the Osborne Cameron Tories who are cut, cut, cut. They're spending very strategically uh, in areas and communities that they're seeking to win or they've won. Ben Houch in the Teesside Mayor brought the airport into public ownership, introduced free parking, popular, I'm afraid, with Labour voters. And what the policy review should do is build on the commitments that Keir Starmer made in the leadership election and then hasn't spoken yeah. about ever since, which is taxing the rich to invest in the economy, uh, bringing public ownership uh, to areas of the economy where clearly the private sector has failed, as Test and Trace has also well, found. I mean, you have to say, yeah, you have to say, of course, the Conservatives certainly did that in the railways already. And I just wonder, uh, we spoke to Steve Rotherham earlier, who obviously was Jeremy Corbyn's PPS, and you might have heard him say, you know, I am demonstrating in this area that socialism works. Now, the trouble for Keir Starmer is, does that not send a shiver down his spine? Well, it shouldn't do, because actually, if you look at the results, many of them are dire for the Labour Party. But Steve Rotherham's a case in point. But also, if you look, for example, in Wales, Mark Drayford... Uh, after the terrible 2019 election route for Labour, said that Labour needed to commit to those radical policies, and it's worked in Wales. If you look at Salford, if you look at Preston, both led by radical mm -hmm. Labour administrations, they've booked the trend. And that's because when people think they're not just voting against the Conservatives, which I'm afraid is all the Labour Party has become in much of the country, but they actually think they're voting for something which actually inspires them in some way, then Labour can book that trend. And what we've seen, I'm afraid, in large parts of the country is when voters are completely bereft of any sense of what the Labour Party would actually do with political power if given the opportunity, they won't vote or they'll take their votes yeah. elsewhere. And when you have a canny Conservative Party, which, as I've said, is mixing state intervention in a way that Cameron and Osborne didn't do, as well as populist nationalism, that's a potent mix which has filled a vacuum yeah. left by a Labour Party which no longer has the courage of any of its convictions. Uh, Dia, you know, from the Telegraph perspective, the idea of state intervention, the idea of spend, spend, spend and the Towns Fund and so forth is it, probably an anathema. So how do you square it with those Tory voters? Who are they going to need to keep on side as well? I think it will become an issue quite soon. I mean, uh, as Owen says, it is a little bit difficult for, for Labour to, say, commit to spend X amount when the Tories are already doing that, for example, because historically that might yeah. have been somewhere that you could have some differentiation between the two parties. With the pandemic, um, it has become a situation where there is a lot of spend, spend, spend going on um, uh, with a Conservative Party in power. Now, at one point, um, I think uh, 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 some sort of conservative thinking will kick in uh, once the pandemic is over and uh, the government will have to find ways of either raising taxes or cutting spending um, uh, to, uh, to, to to keep up with the, with the, with the way we've uh, become used to over the last couple of years to, to spend mm. as a country. Um, and then what happens? Are the gov is the government getting prepared uh, to create um, either the jobs or the infrastructure, put the 
the, keep the infrastructure in place uh, for those cuts or tax rises to happen? Um, are they going to be able to take their newly won uh, constituents with them? You know, are they going to take uh, uh, people, uh, the voters from Hartlepool, uh, along with them when that change in policy happens? Um, what exactly have these people, uh, the voters in Hartlepool, um, Voted for voted the Tories. Well, you know what? Yes. What are the expectations from the Tories, and how are well, they going to say. You know, sort of hold on to those and deliver on those? Is going to be the biggest challenge for the government now. Yeah, because 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 what the government is trying to do is occupy the centre ground. Where Dominic Cummings said very clearly that centre ground simply doesn't exist. It's you know it's a myth. Well, I mean, maybe it is a new maybe it is a new centre ground. I mean, you know, who knows? We are in very very complicated times. You don't need me to tell you that things are all topsy turvy at the moment. Uh, but it does seem like in a time of pandemic, when the government has done, you know, he's, it's had extraordinary success with the vaccine rollout. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But Dominic, can we say very? That's been a plus. Um, uh, but you know, ha what next? That is where the government needs to look yeah. now, and that's going to be the biggest challenge. But well, let me come back to uh, um, Owen on that, what next for Labour, because it seems to me that Labour is looking in three directions. It's looking to the Red Wall, which has got one set of problems. It's looking to Wales, where it's strong, which are completely different. And certainly, Mark Draper is not going to be taking any lessons in Labour policy from Keir Starmer. And we're looking to Scotland, where we absolutely have no idea what Labour would do in Scotland going forward when it comes to an in, a, in, a second independence referendum. So there's all sorts of different imperatives. And Keir Starmer, it, it's fair to say, has, over the last 24 hour, four hours, it sounded a lot more irritated and irritable uh, than we've ever heard him before. Do you think, Owen Jones, that uh, Keir Starmer is a transitional leader, or do you think he'll be the leader that takes us into the next general election? Well, I think there's an increasing question over that. Look, the whole pitch of Keir Starmer was competence, essentially, wasn't it? It was uh, to bet the house on that. That was the dividing line with the government, and it was incinerated by the thankfully, huge success of the vaccine rollout programme. That wasn't actually the government. That was the public sector and the NHS, which Labour could have trumpeted. But because Keir Starmer's team didn't use the pandemic as an opportunity to set out an alternative vision, they've been left with very little to say. Now, they've been saying today in the newspapers that, well, actually, the reason is, and I think they've said to you, the reason for that is the pandemic's in the way. But that's a terrible excuse. I mean, if you look back, World War II, a far bigger emergency, yeah. of course, than the one we're currently facing. Labour used that emergency in World War II to set out a clear vision of what the country would look like under them. Once we win the war, Labour said, we've got to win the peace. And they didn't do that with a pandemic. And I think the problem with Keir Starmer at the moment is, you know, his pitch in that leadership election was keep the radical policies that are popular, like public ownership, taxing the rich, getting rid of tuition fees, unity in the Labour Party and competence. And I'm afraid he hasn't stuck to that very basic democratic mandate. And in the same time, I and mean, if you look at the way he's pitched towards the so-called red wall, a lot of it's been pretty patronising. It's been kind of, let's go to focus groups and repeat back what people tell us. You know, all kind of nothing wrong with a flag before I get an angry tirade on social media. But the way that focus rather than on, on policies and vision with let's fly the flag a lot, it just screeches inauthenticity. So I think if Keir Starmer wants to resurrect a leadership which is clearly in crisis, then he should recommit to a, a vision, uh, you know, build on what Clement Attlee did during World War II, national emergency, Labour best position to deal with what comes after that national emergency. You know, I mean, as an example, I think that when a Labour leader during this crisis cannot stare down the barrel of a camera when asked about NHS nurses' pay rises, about whether they should get the pay rise they deserve, and stumbles and talks about negotiating upwards from 2.5%. Mm -hmm. That is a Labour Party in trouble. Okay. Instead, what Labour should have done is said, we applauded those key workers who carried our country through a national emergency, we'll give them the pay rise we deserve. We will, instead of universal credit being woefully inadequate, which millions of people have seen because of the pandemic, we'll build a welfare state that is adequate for Thanks. the times in which live the self-employed, the precarious. That's been exposed during the crisis, yeah. as well as the NHS well, and the key work. And that's what Labour <laughs> failed to well, do, and that's what uh, Labour Owen, Owen, I admire your Saturday afternoon energy. Owen and Dia, thank you both very much.